All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nathan with Transportation Alternatives. And on behalf of TA, welcome to our second session today of Vision Zero Cities Mobility in a Warming World. Please allow me to introduce you to today's moderator, Chris Reed. Chris is an urban planner and associate principal at Bureau Happold, where he consults on energy, climate change, and sustainability planning initiatives with local and regional governments across the United States. Chris was the energy project manager for New York City's roadmap to 80 by 50 climate action plan, the Los Angeles countywide sustainability plan, and he co-chairs the Energy and Emissions Working Group within the Lead for Cities and Communities Rating System. He is a lifelong bicycle commuter. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Nathan. And thank you all for, for joining today. Uh, it's my pleasure to moderate this panel today. Um, I will start with some uh, introductions of our esteemed panelists. Um, then we're going to have an introductory presentation, uh, as well as responses uh, from each of our panelists before moving into a, an audience uh, and moderated question and answer session. Uh, so let me start with Jay Mohorchich. Uh, Jay uh, teaches courses at Lehman College in American Politics, Political Philosophy, and Science Policy. He has previously taught at Johns Hopkins and the University of Mannheim. His research in uh, interests include pragmatism, literature and politics, and the intersections of science and politics, especially the ways that critical infrastructure services structure politics. Next, we have Jim McRae, uh, who is a principal at Design Workshop, an international design studio, where he focuses on designing places that honor nature, people, and culture. Jim's career has taken him across the globe from North America, Asia, and the Middle East. He has broad experience, but is best known for his planning and design of thoughtful urban environments, including transit-oriented and mixed-use districts, commercial corridors and streetscapes, urban parks and plazas, workspaces, as well as sustainable new communities. Next up, we have Marianne Jang, uh, who is an independent consultant with over a decade of international experience working to make cities more sustainable and resilient. Her previous role was at 100RC, leading the work on defining resilient transport in the face of climate change and other risks. And she has previously worked on developing guidelines for integrating land use and transport planning, integrating sustainability strategies into large scale urban projects. And she's led complex multidisciplinary stakeholder and community engagement processes. Finally, uh, we are working on getting Heather Thompson connected. Heather is the CEO, oh, there you are. Heather is the CEO of ITDP and has been involved with ITDP for more than a dozen years. Throughout her career, Ms. Thompson has worked with the environmental nonprofit sector to design and carry out strategies with large-scale impact. She was co-founder and program director of ClimateWorks and as a consultant has advised clients, including the Asian Development Bank, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and Environmental Defense Fund on finding ways to help our cities and natural systems increase resilience in the face of climate change population growth and other development pressures. Welcome everyone. So we're gonna start with a uh, introductory presentation from Jay. Uh, and Jay, I'll, I will turn it over to you and ask you to, to share your screen uh, as I know you have a few slides. Okay, thank you very much for those introductions. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to bring, bring up these slides, there we go. Um, so the talk is mobility in a warming world, and it falls under that umbrella as do all the other contributions today. Um, and the basic premise of this work and of this presentation is that human beings need pretty large amounts of energy to transport themselves around and other things to move people and things. Um, and in fact, transportation is constrained by the available energy that a society has. So this is actually meant pretty literally. It's the total available primary energy that a society has could be defined by the total amount of gas it burns, coal that it burns, the amount of solar panels and the electricity that comes out of those solar panels. So everything you do in a society that produces or consumes energy would go into this calculation. And so you can think of you know, the United States or the world as this giant 
energy machine that demands a certain amount of energy to move around people and things. And because we are extremely energy rich, we often don't think of this as a constraining factor. We just think, oh, you put gas in the car, you, you, know, you have like electric trains that run underground and then that's just kind of how it goes. But this is in fact a fundamental constraint for human societies. Um, all human societies have had to deal with energy constraints on their ability to transport things. Um, and it also might be the case that people in the future might have less energy available to them to move people and things. They might have a little bit less energy because maybe they're running more energy efficient systems. They might have a lot less energy, maybe because climate change has destroyed their ability to uh, practice fossil fuel extraction, for example. Um, or they could be in a really dire situation in which they have very, very little energy. And so we're gonna model situations where people have both 50% less energy so you can think of this as kind of like a slow, gentle transition to a post-carbon economy in which we use things like solar panels, wind power, battery technology, and far more efficient vehicles and devices to reduce our total energy demands down by something like 50% from a current US baseline. The 2018 US baseline is what we're working from here. And note that something like half the world already works from a baseline that's far, far lower than the US baseline. So this 50% scenario is not some type of apocalypse. It's basically like, what if we all lived about as efficiently as people in you know, Mexico or um, I don't know, Slovenia live or something like that. Uh, so that this is not an apocalypse scenario. The second scenario though, is it's much, much worse. It imagines a scenario where because of either severe climate change or other future scenarios, um, human societies have 95% less energy for transportation than they otherwise would. So this is a very severe situation in which you have essentially no access to fossil fuels and maybe even things like uh, robust wind power are maybe out of reach of this society for technical reasons. Uh, so the second is a very, is a very severe scenario. Uh, within those two scenarios, we can just do some actually pretty simple math and say, well, the ways that we get around consume different levels of energy. We know that cars are much more energy intensive than our trains and buses, because you can put a lot of people on trains and buses and trains run with less friction than do buses or cars. And we know that bicycles and walking are still more efficient because they just use people's natural metabolism to get them to move around. You just have to give people some food and then they can walk and bike. So we know that those are pretty efficient. But how specifically, let's not just broadly say, oh, biking and walking are great and cars are bad. Like how useful is a car actually in these scenarios and how useful is walking or biking or using rapid transit in these scenarios? So this is the big like slide with all the numbers on it basically. Um, but what this essentially says is that first in that first column, we calculate the energy intensity that a mode of transportation requires. So this is just how many megajoules does it burn to get you one kilometer? So a pretty extravagant number would be something over one. So cars are anywhere from, if they burn gas, from about 1.3 for a hyper, hyper efficient, like a Volvo two-seater that came out in Germany 10 years ago. It's like the most efficient gas car you can find. It burns about 1.3 megajoules per thousand meters. And then a pretty inefficient car like a Hummer or a Bugatti or something would burn like five megajoules per passenger kilometer. And most people's cars fall somewhere in between. And then if you electrify the cars, you say, well, electric cars are much more efficient, aren't they? And they are, in fact, they're, they're a lot better. Um, something around 0 0.6, 0 0.7 megajoules per passenger kilometer is what an electric car would demand. So you can see already it's something like twice as efficient, maybe even more than twice as efficient. Um, but it still doesn't get you as low as these other modes of transit that we can look at. If we look at the next step down, it's actually internal combustion engine buses. They burn about half a megajoule per passenger kilometer. That's because you can put a lot of people on buses. Buses are much more efficient than our individual cars. Um, but they're still not highly efficient, as you can see from the numbers here. Now, if you electrify them, you get another 50% reduction or so, depending on the technical details. Um, and that's pretty good. You know, we're only burning about a third of a megajoule per passenger kilometer. Um, and then if you get down to bicycles, metros, and walking, you find some really efficient stuff. 
One interesting finding, as you can see, is that um, walking is actually less efficient than riding a bike or taking the train in most, under most assumptions. Um, this is pretty interesting because if you're in a very energy constrained situation, but you still somehow have access to say bicycles, because bicycles are a durable good, uh, you would actually be better off biking around if you could, because you would burn a, a lot fewer calories per kilometer traveled if you have a working bicycle. And if you're in a very serious situation where your society is calorie constrained, that could actually matter quite a bit. Um, so we see that bicycles are the winner here with just a tenth of a megajoule per passenger kilometer. Walking is about a fifth of a megajoule and metros are right in between those two. So you say, okay, that's great. You just read me a bunch of decimals, but what does that mean in practical terms? Like what, what is the actual implication of that? Um, and the practical implication of that is that if you are under this sort of demi Anthropocene or 50% reduction scenario, that's the, the fourth column over there. Your effective commute limit with a car it, that burns gas is only about 30 kilometers. So you're fairly constrained, but your effective commute limit with most other things is essentially no constraint. It's like 100 kilometers or higher. So that's not too bad. But in the serious scenario, the post A, the final column on the far right here, um, that's where you have a 95% energy reduction. Your effective commute limit is tiny with a gas car. It's only about 4,000 meters. So if you were to drive more than 4,000 meters, you would run out of you. You would exceed your energy budget for the year quite quickly under that scenario. And we all know that a, a gas car that can only go, in this case, 3.9 kilometers is not especially useful. You're better off using basically anything else if that's your commute, your, your commute distance. So human settlements using gas cars under that scenario would not be able to expand really beyond about four kilometers between where people live and where people work. It would be a hugely constrained community and would probably use different modes of transit anyway, just for practical purposes. Um, and if you go down the list here on the right, you can see that the practical effective size of a community is hugely influenced by the effective commute limit. This is just how far each transportation system can go under these energy constraint limits. So bicycles, they can go 48 kilometers in one direction. You could actually have suburbs if everyone had a bike under these severe energy constrained scenarios. Um, but something like internal combustion buses, eh, you're limited to about nine kilometers one way commute. And that's actually, that's quite severe. You can't go the length of Manhattan under that situation, for example. Um, and so there's obviously there's more to talk about here with the specific numbers, but I wanna move on. This is just a quick slide of the energy intensity, which we just talked about on the left, and then the speed that things can usually go. Speed is a huge multiplier for the amount of energy consumed by a given mode of transportation. Um, so you can see in this case that cars are quite inefficient, but they go pretty fast. Metros are very efficient and they can go pretty fast. So that's a good trade off there. And then walking is very slow, but it's pretty efficient. And then cycling is medium speed, but also very, very efficient. Um, obviously, there's a ton to talk about here, but I want to, no one likes a super long presentation. So I'm going to keep moving. Um, that is the basic outline of this work. So basically, if you constrain the amount of energy available in a society, which modes of transit can take you how far under those constraints? That is kind of the basic setup. And I can make these slides available to people so they can look through all the numbers um, kind of at their leisure and uh, have any questions and comments. But thank you for listening. I'm very excited to hear what others have to say. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, very much. And I saw some chatter in the chat box, which is great to see already. So perhaps you can bear those in mind when we move into our discussion portion. Um, our first respondent is going to be Heather. And Heather has a, a few uh, slides to uh, aid in this discussion. So let me share my screen here. And Thanks. you should see it right about now. Thanks. Great. And. Um, Thanks uh, so much for having me uh, here today. It's great to be part of Vision Zero and anything that Transportation Alternatives puts on. So thanks again for having me here. Um, again, I'm Heather Thompson. I'm CEO with the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Um, and Jay, thanks so much for sharing your study. I know I got to read it in the longer version and I think my first reaction was, gosh, are we really moving into a world where we have to be so concerned about um, such constraints? Um, but uh, 
as the floods and fires and everything are, are getting so much worse, um, I think <laughs> we really do need to start thinking about these constraints. Um, I myself have been focused on environmental work and climate change for about 20 years, so you'd think I'd be thinking more about that, but I'm still um, really focused on the mitigation side of things. And if you could move to the next slide. Um, ITDP has done a number of scenarios over the years, and one or two of them came to mind in reaction to uh, your work, Jay. So I thought I would share a couple of um, factoids from them. Um, we've done these scenarios essentially to look at what sort of um, abatement potential, what sort of uh, potential there is to reduce um, carbon and other greenhouse gases from the transportation sector. Um, and the first one we did was in 2014, and the last one we did was in 2018. And we've done these on a regular basis, essentially to try to, to inform discussions that are happening at the city level, but also at the national and international level, because transportation wasn't getting that much attention, and now it is, which is great. Um, the last scenario we did is um, what I'm showing here, which is called the three revolutions in urban transportation. And this was the one that we did most recently in 2018. So it's just a couple of years old. And it kind of came to the same conclusions. Rather than looking at energy as a constraint, it really looked at what do we need to drive down carbon? And the conversation was becoming so much about electrification and automation, but we knew that that really wasn't going to be enough. And essentially what the scenario did was show that. It showed that if we moved to electrification and automation, it's great in that we reduce some of the carbon, but we still have a lot of vehicles on the road. So we really need to move towards sharing, which I think is kind of the same message that you're, you're making. We need to move towards more energy uh, efficient uh, modes of, of transportation that don't just take into account um, the actual electricity that the vehicle is using. And if you see, um, if we just focus on automation and electrification, we only reduce our carbon emissions to about by about 63%. Whereas if we also focus on sharing um, public transportation, metros, cycling, bike share, then we get um, down to 85% reduction. And that's really what we need to be on our climate uh, target. So with just the automation and electrification, we don't get down to that two degree scenario, um, which for those of you that follow Follow climate science know that we need to get down to a two degree scenario or even below that to a 1.5 degree scenario. So we really need all three revolutions. And if you could move to the next slide, um, I also thought for this crowd and also what really um, helps support the message in your study, Jay, is another piece that we did um, looking at cycling. So our first scenario really didn't um, look at cycling as aggressively as we realized we could and should. Um, so in our second scenario, we increased um, the vehicle kilometers traveled um, by cycling up to 14%. So a 14% mode share, which currently around the world, it's about 7%, but 14% is reasonable when you think that some cities are up to like a 40, 50% um, mode share. So this was kind of an average of 11% in, in places like the United States, which is on par with a city like Boulder, and then going up to like 25% in Asian cities where we thought that there could be much more um, cycling. But anyways, you see the results here, which are really huge. Um, 300 uh, uh, additional megatons just from cycling on top of the other abatement scenario and additional $25 trillion saved. So again, it shows the huge potential on things like cycling um, combined with, again, the public transportation that I showed before. So um, thought I would throw that those uh, rebuttals in. Um, and yeah, look forward to the discussion and happy to answer any questions on this. Great, thank you so much, Heather. Um, I, we, we've decided for uh, the re these responses, we're gonna go from like the, the largest scale to the to the small scale and then um, wrap up with a conversation on, on resilience. So uh, building upon what, what Jay and Heather have shown, really look taking a more global lens, um, I thought I'd share a little bit uh, about putting this into the context of um, how city policymakers um, are thinking about these discussions. And so, Excuse me, I'll just move this into uh, full screen mode. 
Um, so in, in my work as a consulting or urban planner, um, I've been working a lot of climate action plans uh, with, with, with cities and, and MPOs and, and regional governments. Um, and one of those was the New York City Roadmap to 80 by 50, which I thought would be uh, good for this audience. And what I wanted to show is just a couple, couple of, of charts. Um, one is that this is the overall uh, transportation policy roadmap for reducing emissions from the transportation sector. And so you see that uh, New York has already done, uh, has already had seen a decrease from 2005 until 2014. Um, and then under business as usual, this is um, the way that New York's defined this is really taking into account fuel economy standards um, that at the time of the study, uh, where we believe we're, we're coming down the pike. Hey, Chris, sorry as to well break as... in. I don't think people can see your screen right now, just FYI. Oh, okay. <laughs> that would be helpful. Okay, how about now? Great, all right, you missed the beautiful, uh, oh, here we go, cover. You're seeing the full screen version? Great. Um, so this, this study was completed in, um, or this plan was completed in 2016, and uh, already New York had seen uh, a modest decrease in, in transport emissions from 2005. Um, and under business as usual, um, saw that we were getting uh, we could expect to get 33% closer to the 80% the target. And that's just from federal fuel economy standards, uh, as well as initiatives already underway by the state of New York, including select bus service, uh, for example. Now, there's a lot of discussion in national policy circles about transportation electrification and how we, we how uh, electric cars, trucks, uh, buses, um, and, and other vehicles are, are so important, and they are, um, they absolutely are. However, uh, we have to be thinking about mode shift as, the, the, as giving us the, mo the, the, the biggest chunk of, of, this, uh, of, the, of the target um, is really going to come from mode shift um, and, and getting folks out of vehicles uh, into uh, non-motorized uh, transportation, bicycling, walking, uh, and public transit. And that's what you're seeing here is uh, when, when we modeled it, um, that this is uh, really the biggest piece of that, that pie. Um, and here we have the, the mode share targets. Uh, so this is for trips within New York City. Um, on the left, you have um, the existing mode share in 2014. Um, and on the right, you have the target mode share for 2050. And New York is already at 38% uh, walking trips. Um, you can see, uh, as, as well as, um, you can see 11% total here um, uh, from, from, from biking and walking. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, these boxes should be over, uh, sorry, 38 plus one, so 39%. Um, and that's moving up to 50%. So, uh, Already a great starting point. Really, where was the opportunity to, to increase? It was in uh, the bicycling um, mode. Um, really, uh, there's, there's a lot to build upon from, from the walkability standpoint. Transit systems um, pretty much at capacity. Um, maybe uh, some ability to add here and there. Um, but we're really looking at, at bicycling as being the major opportunity. One thing I want to inject into this conversation is that as we're talking about sort of globally, how are our societies adapting to a warming world? You know, it's not that everyone bears an equal burden. And if we just take a look at emissions, for example, we know that emissions from high income households are much greater per capita than those of low income households. And we know globally, that the, the societies and communities that are most responsible for climate change um, are not the ones that are bearing the brunt, right? Uh, we know that, the, that disadvantaged communities um, are experiencing the impacts that are generated um, by our uh, high income and high consumer households. And then finally, um, I currently live in Los Angeles, and as we're talking about this, uh, these these revolutions, and we're thinking about our streets, we're not only thinking about reducing carbon emissions, but also all those things that can support resilience. Whether it is um, shade trees and shade structures over over bus stops to 
uh, to help manage and, um, the increasing heat and heat events, whether it's using cool surfaces, um, as well as providing the infrastructure, benches and tables and other street furniture um, to support community cohesion um, as, as we face uh, more and more climate hazards. So I'll, I'll pause up there um, and I'm gonna, uh, I think this is a good point to transition over to Jim, um, who is going to uh, share a little bit about more of the urban design scale. Great, well, thanks Chris and thanks to Jay and Heather for your thoughts. Um, I do not have any graphics, even though I'm an urban designer. I really should, but I apologize. I thought we would just keep this as a conversation. Um, you know, for us, I, I practice in mixed use generally across the, the world, but uh, in North America. And I think what we're trying to do as a firm is to anticipate some of these issues as it relates to the urban environments. Um, but having said that, I think, as Chris has sort of pointed out uh, through the carbon uh, chart that he showed with households, you know, that a lot of this issue is really in the suburbs, right? The, the challenges of proximity and energy use in the suburban context is really where, at least as an urban designer we're in our firm, we're trying to spend most of our time. Um, so for us, it's really how do we uh, address this issue of proximity, how, you know, knowing that all the infrastructure, the way we live currently, really was predicated on the ability to move, you know, across cities, across uh, different regions very easily and conveniently. And under the, you know, worst case scenario, obviously that may change, that will have an impact on how far one can go. So as an urban planner, what we're, what I'm looking at is how do we revitalize sort of suburban context, things like um, existing retail centers that, um, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now really may not be necessary, but uh, occupy uh, very important parts of our kind of suburban context in the, in the context or in the manner that they could be uh, reutilized, um, not just for streetscapes, but to repurpose them um, as kind of opportunities to cluster different industry. Uh, we're, we're working on plans where we're thinking about food production so again, with the context of moving supply chain and moving you know, material and goods around as we have been, that may be challenged. So how do we as a society, especially in a suburban context, produce the food, produce the materials that we would need to, to have and live? Um, and so these um, sites that tend to be pretty close to where most of us live in the suburban context, uh, like shopping centers and malls become a great opportunity as, as already is evident in being uh, really opportunities to densify, to provide, provide different uh, uses, whether that's uh, community farming, uh, whether the, that's a clustering of healthcare or civic services, whether that's light industries that really put um, kind of goods and services in closer proximity to, to pe where people live uh, and, and work. Obviously technology, as we're all experiencing right now, has been the great bridge for you know, us not being able to move around given the pandemic. So I would imagine that people will continue to you know, be able to work remotely. Um, we're seeing more and more corporations realize as Google and Facebook and others have announced that you know, their, their plan moving forward is to really allow for digital work and their workforce to be remote. So there may not be this need as historically to have, you know, housing and out in the suburbs where people have to move around quite long distances. So having said all that, as an urban designer, you know, we are looking to uh, sites to revitalize and densify. Uh, I think the proposition of how do you, you know, take these issues of any energy generation, food production, uh, other goods and services and actually start to um, put that into the more suburban context uh, is something to consider. And then as Chris mentioned in his last slide, you know, it's just how do we make for a much more safe and convenient and comfortable world. And so converting, you know, sort of these major transportation corridors and roadways, you know, to be uh, less about the car and obviously more about bike and pet and other forms of transit are going to be important, but also to make sure that they are still safe uh, that there is an opportunity to use those corridors for green infrastructure, so capturing and reusing water, uh, whether that's for the benefit of public realm or the urban uh, areas. Um, so it's really, as an urban designer, trying to really uh, 
stitch all of these ideas together uh, and find opportunities with public sector, with cities and municipalities, and certainly developers and landowners to um, adjust and adapt to the conditions that we will face in the future. So with that, I'll give that back over to you, Chris. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, our, our final respondent is uh, Marianne. Marianne, would you Hi. like to take it away? Yes, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for having us and it's nice to be here um, with you all. So um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, Jay, I found your presentation in your paper very interesting. I think when I read it, my mind immediately went to, yes, this affirms everything that, you know, that I believe in when it comes to transportation, it should be low energy, it should be low carbon. Um, but, you know, um, so putting my resilience hat on, um, I thought one thing that I could start off with is just maybe to um, set the scene a little bit um, about the definition of resilience. And so I used to work at a nonprofit called 100 Resilient Cities. Um, and the, you know, a lot of, I, I feel like a, a lot of the ways people understand resilience is sort of climate change adaptation. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, from the work that we've done across, um, you know, across the, uh, around 100 cities uh, that we've worked with, um, you know, we've understood um, the definition of resilience to be not the, just the capacity of something to, to bounce back from a shock or stress, but um, the ability of, you know, a system, an object to, um, you know, to deliver, you know, benefits during good times, as well as, you know, post, uh, during a disaster and post-disaster. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that, um, some of the thoughts I had um, regarding, uh, you know, regarding this, uh, Topic was just um, yeah how important it is obviously for the whatever transport infrastructure um, you know, we think is most appropriate and I totally agree that you know um, in a given the scenarios that Heather mentioned um, and and you know the work that that Chris and you know the the principles that Jim worked to um, obviously non motorized modes is, modes are some of the most important um, ones that we should rely on. Um, you know uh, just thinking how uh, these modes also need to be prepared for. Uh, you know, for the myriad climate risks um, and other sort of disasters that uh, we're likely going to face. Uh, I mean, we're obviously in one now with the pandemic, uh, and you know, and with the fires and you know, and the floods that we've um, and the hurricanes that we've uh, witnessed. It's really important that we ensure that the infrastructure that we um, are building is is future proof. Um, and we know that uh, you know, of all the different transport uh, systems and modes out there, that that walking and biking, walking and biking are, are two of the most uh, resilient in terms of um, being able to, uh, you know, help a, a, a society and a city uh, in its recovery. Uh, we know that during Sandy, I know it's, I'm talking to a converted, you know, to, to the, I'm pre preaching to the converted, right, about this, but um, uh, we all know here in New York how uh, bike commuting uh, spiked because gasoline was inaccessible. Uh, and, you know, bikes were really the main way to get supplies to really to poorly connected the remote neighborhoods that were pretty devastated um, after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we know also in hur after Hurricane um, Harvey in, in Houston, most of the cars were flooded and in the city of Houston, their bike share program saw a huge increase in bike rides. Um, and that bike share program um, called B-Cycle also donated about 700 bikes to local residents. Uh, and we know uh, you know, after the earthquake in Mexico City in 2017, that bikes were the main way um, that they were getting, uh, that residents were getting around and that support, critical supplies uh, were getting around. And we also know now, you know, so to bring it up now that, that bikes are basically, it's impossible to get a bike now. Uh, everyone's choosing to cycle um, or walk, uh, you know, uh, in this, uh, you know, in this moment where public transportation seems a little bit more risky. Um, uh, and, uh, and it's, you know, and it's sort of unfortunate because in, in the parallel to the fact that bikes are, um, there are huge bike sales are also huge car sales, but maybe we'll talk about that uh, later on <laughs> in the, in the panel discussion. Um, but another, the other, so the flip side of being, you know, having the infrastructure that's prepared for, um, for a disaster and, to, you know, prepared to support recovery, I think is also infrastructure that's going to provide benefits um, today. And, you know, I think people have talked about, um, benefits in terms of, um, you know, low carbon um, and sustainable, uh, you know, modes, but, uh, uh, you know, and, and Chris has also talked about sort of, um, you know, how it's uh, the lowest income sort of communities that, uh, you know, are disproportionately feeling the effects of, um, you know, of, uh, 
uh, you know, of, of our current transport systems. I mean, I think the, the flip side is just to talk about also how, um, you know, how, uh, you know, how transport burden some communities can be. Um, and, you know, in, in, uh, in cities, especially in the US where uh, the car is the main mode of getting around, uh, households are spending um, between 20 to 30% of their income on, um, on transport. Uh, in New York, um, I looked this up, so in New York, um, HUD says that on average, people spend about 14% of their income on public tran on transport because we largely rely on an affordable public transport system. Um, but it's very close to HUD's threshold of a transport burden um, percentage, which is 15%. Um, so that was, that was interesting uh, to know. Um, so yeah, I feel like I don't need to preach more, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to the conversation. All right, thank you, Marianne. Well, I, I think uh, you know something that you touched on there was the, maybe the lessons that we have to learn from our current circumstances, right? Let's talk about the elephant in the room and the fact that we're all on Zoom. Um, but we've also seen in this time that um, there's been an embrace of uh, you know a community, a walkable, bikeable community. Mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, uh, basically won a campaign based on the 15-minute city. Um, what can we learn from this, uh, in, and how does it support resilience, and um, how does it relate to you know this this uh, far-flung scenario of an energy-constrained environment? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, I mean, I just think that the situation we're in. Oh, thanks. has um, again reaffirmed you know the importance of uh, of infrastructure that that doesn't rely too much on um, you know an, an energy intensive mode of getting around you know that um, you know the walking and biking we know have so many benefits um, you know and I think that uh, you know and, and you know I mean if it wasn't a pandemic and we weren't all stuck at home. <laughs> I doubt that, you know, I, I still think that walk, you know, everyone would agree that, that walking and cycling is definitely, you know, uh, just the most equitable way to get around and also it's just incredibly pleasant and it's also good for your health. Um, you know, but one other thing that I think um, Anne Hidalgo especially um, has been thinking about, and she had a, a chief resilience officer who was sort of focused on this, was um, how to prepare the streets um, so that they are uh, more than just uh, you know car free. That how else how what other you know what other purposes could streets serve? Um, and I, I think that they had a they had a draft initiative which I think has now become has become folded into the 15 minute city uh, proposal. But it was their idea of sort of a resilient street, and it was sort of like could you make streets a, a mix between a street and a public space? Could you make it um, somewhere where uh, not only is there you know uh, shelter from the weather. Um, you know, if it's hot or, you know, um, but could you also make, uh, you know, make these streets sort of, uh, you know, uh, mitigation for when there's, when there's heavy rainfall or there's flooding? Could you yeah. um, provide could you, food on these streets? Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, and that relates well to some of what Jim was talking about, about urban agriculture and um, some other things that he's seeing on the design side. Um, so, I mean, Jim, Jim, what else, what else are we seeing from how neighborhoods, commercial districts and uh, transportation systems are, are adapting and transforming under under our new circumstances. Yeah, well, I, I think we're seeing uh, a lot of evidence uh, from a city point of view about uh, because of the pandemic and because of concern on using transit and because transit has been reduced in service that people have to find other ways to get to work for those that are still employed and that are uh, kind of essential workers. So we've been working actually in Las Vegas for the city of Las Vegas for a number of years of developing their downtown uh, park master plan. Uh, what's, what they've been finding, and, and we've been using technology and specifically phone data to track how people are actually moving around the city and what they've discovered is that in fact, in, in the kind of immediate area of the older part of downtown in Las Vegas, that ridership, bike ridership is up by I think 30%, which it was pretty low to begin with granted, but it just clearly speaks to the fact that when people have to use uh, other forms and modes, they will. In combination to that, uh, what we're now doing is with the city and a number of business owners is to determine through technology 
what of the downtown can actually the streets and the infrastructure and mainly the street corridors, what can be kind of closed off, right? Become the sort of expansion for outdoor gathering, dining, et cetera. And, and so we're using some modeling to basically determine where we can do that, that has the greatest impact to businesses, but also does not sacrifice any other public safety issues, i.e. EMT kind of response zones or times. Um, and so I, it's a really fascinating sort of outcome and unexpected sort of a benefit, I would say, a uh, realization that we can actually close down streets within the sort of urban areas of many cities. In the city of Vancouver, we're, we're doing, we did a map park master plan. They're doing a very similar study, like I mentioned in Vegas, where they're trying to uh, actually take streets out of play permanently, not as temporary solutions, which to us is not just an immediate response for businesses, but it's also, I think, a really important thing as it relates to social equity, meaning that in the more impoverished, uh, lower income neighborhoods across and streets now can actually become, call it public space, right? For the benefit of people who probably don't have as much as more affluent neighborhoods in the downtown. So, um, you know, I think there's some benefits and positive outcomes that have, you know, kind of resulted as part of this unexpected disruption in our lives. Gotcha. Heather, I'm, I'm curious if you're seeing this, uh, these benefits as, are, are these are these kickstarting the three revolutions? Is it, are, are we facing new barriers? What What's happening from your perspective? Well, it is, it's, uh, you know, you follow the field and, and the, the tension changes, right? We're not really so obsessed with automa automated vehicles these days, not that they aren't still maybe part of the solution, especially when we're so concerned about touching everything and, you know, avoiding, <laughs> avoiding humans. Um, so maybe automation discussion will flare up, but it's not the one at the front and center right now. But I think, you know, maybe just to carry on the, the point on walkability, um, you know, uh, and, and I guess also thinking about walkability, but also bringing in the point, Jim, that you brought earlier about land use. Um, we just, and I'll put it in the chat, we just released a tool uh, last week, earlier this week, the days are blurring, called uh, Pedestrians First. And it is a tool that uses open data, online available open data, to look at the walkability of more than a thousand cities around the world. So please go on and check it out, either your city or cities that you're working in. Um, but it, it looks at the walkability of cities based on, um, of course, the walking environment itself, but also what the how access, um, how accessible green spaces, um, how accessible services are like healthcare and education, and how accessible public transit is. So it's really at the heart of the conversation right now. And, you know, I think what we see, especially in poorer areas, is that it, um, the environment may be walkable, but there aren't any services to walk to. So you still are forced to take some form of longer transportation, most often public transportation, right? So I think that's this whole idea of the 15 minute neighborhood. It's not just about making the environment safer to walk in, but it's also about mixed land, land use and how can we bring those services to people. And in a number of cities that we looked at, what we find often is either um, the, the land use is not developed to be dense, block sizes are way too long, but in some areas, especially older, um, uh, older cities, the block uh, sizes actually are quite small and it is dense, but they're not, there's no people living in those areas. It's all commercial or, um, so it's all about, um, you know, of course, um, making cities more dense, but also making sure that those services are there. And, you know, in terms of our findings, what you, what we found, saw was that cities like Paris are at the top of the heap, which is great, but we also see cities like Hong Kong, um, Bogota, Santiago, um, um, Lima, Peru, Karachi, Pakistan, also are actually at the top of the heap because they do have some of those older principles that we were talking about with the neighborhoods that were designed to be smaller back when we didn't have energy propulsion transportation. So it really is kind of bringing these ideas back and bringing that community back. So I encourage everybody to go uh, take a look at Pedestrians First. It's a really user-friendly tool with some really interesting findings. All right, thank you, Heather. Um, I want to uh, uh, shift over to, to Jay. Um, there's been a, a couple of questions directed your way. Uh, one, one was about um, 
uh, thinking holistically about energy and whether you considered uh, embodied energy uh, in the study. And then the other question here um, was uh, from uh, Amy LaCourse asking, uh, what are your thoughts on um, one, one constraint nowadays, and I'm in California, as, as air quality continues to worsen and it may not be safe to be outdoors all the time, how do we ensure that it's safe and healthy to use micromobility, shared mode cycling and walking? Um, and I would extend that to uh, instances of high heat or extreme cold or, or other um, physical constraints that we may be up against. Yeah, definitely. Those are both great questions. Um, I think on the question of embodied energy, the findings there are actually really interesting because I was worried about this too, writing the paper. I was like, wait, I just did transportation. What if, like, if I do embodied energy, it turns out that, you know, like a classic thing you'll hear is that electric cars consume more energy and resources to produce than gas cars. So are they actually worse for the environment in this hidden way? And what I found is that in general, energy for use to actually drive or use the thing swamps energy for manufacture by something like nine to one. So especially if the thing is in use for a long time, the energy it consumes to be used just ends up being way more important than the energy that it requires for its manufacture. And then additionally, you can sort of, and I go over this in the full text of the paper, which I put in the chat below for people. Um, you can kind of get a rough sense of this by just looking at the weight of the thing that is manufactured because the total weight of something is actually a really good proxy for how much energy it takes to manufacture and how many resources it consumes. So, you know, cars weigh like about two to 4,000 kilograms and bikes weigh like 10. And so that, that gives you a sense of the scale and walking shoes weigh like about half a kilogram or something. And so that gives you a sense of the manufacturing scale of kind of each thing. Um, and then buses obviously are super heavy, right? They're like 10,000 kilograms or something, but you can, put 15 to 30 people in a bus, right? Most cities report that their average ridership on buses is like 15 to 18 or something. So if you divide that number, then you say, oh, it's worse than a bike, but it's, it's a lot better than a car. And actually the numbers on embodied energy end up matching the numbers on energy for use actually pretty closely. So that was good because then I didn't have to redo the whole project basically. Um, and then the question on air pollution, rising dangers of being outside um, of kind of additional exposure to the world that climate change engenders. Um, the answer there is, is very, I think, tough and bleak. And it's that I'm looking at scenarios where we don't have a choice. Because a lot of our discussions of this are premised about like choices between different modes, about what we would prefer to do, what is better for us um, and things like this. But I'm imagining a situation sometime between 20 and 200 years in the future where we are actually just constrained by the actual physics of what we are able to move around in space. And in this situation, it is entirely plausible to me that we have very severe recurring forest fires. And also we cannot afford to put people in like enclosed boxes that filter the air. And so, I mean, and also this isn't some crazy future scenario. People in places like Beijing and Ho Chi Minh City bike every single day and they have among the worst air pollution in the world, air pollution that's comparable to the West Coast at the height of wildfire season. And so I think, I think Amy gets right to the heart of it is that we will become increasingly vulnerable as the sort of the threats rise and as our energy constraints rise. And so the two really kind of like hit you from both sides, I think. It's a really, it's a good question. Great, I wanna, I wanna keep um, sort of chipping away at that a little bit too, because um, the the modes some of us have greater access to or or choice uh, as as you mentioned among modes because we are uh, we are able bodied we um, you know we may have different jobs that have different requirements for for how we travel and what we the equipment that we need to bring along um, or housing prices have forced us to live very far from from our occupations so. I'll open this up to the panel to talk about some of these equity implications of if we are forced into this situation where we, we, we are, are faced with less choice and some of us are faced with even fewer choices, um, how do we approach that as a society? How do we make sure that we are uh, equally, equally uh, or equitably distributing the benefits and burdens? I can oh, say I like it. I like it. I like the pause. <laughs> it's an easy question. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, very, very easy question. Well, I think, so I think it, it I mean, it'll be 
incredibly difficult because there is physical constraints in some situations. I think there's some models like places like Kerala, which is a region in, in Southern India, have achieved high levels of what we would call sustainable living, but they also tend to be quite, quite equitable. Um, so I think that you can look at some models like that, but I'll leave, I'll leave it to, to others from there. Marianne, I see I, you've yeah. unmuted. Oh. Yeah, I have unmuted. I thought I would, I would, I would throw something in there that's maybe a little optimistic. Where I thought, well, we haven't really talked about the role of technology um, and what technology might be able to enable. You know, I know that um, as of now, because of what's going on in the U.S., there is a lot of talk about, you know, demo you know, there's a democratizing of stuff and there's a shared economy that's, you know, that that we're able to um, tap into um, through you know, through various, through technology, like, you know, the ability to share a ride with someone, the ability, you know, the ability to borrow somebody else's car, or borrow someone's bike, I think that's enough for that in Germany, right? Um, you know, and I, I wonder if in the future, okay, we may be super energy constrained and we may not be able to um, have the range of choices, but um, maybe through technology, we'll be able to work out at an individual level anyway. Um, you know, there may be some, some amount of choice. Maybe we can hop a ride on someone's tandem, uh, you know, maybe we can borrow someone's pogo stick. I, there might be other ways of, <laughs> of getting around. But Heather, go on. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, and I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I was just maybe going to pick out my, my favorite stick, which I think we don't use enough, which is, you know, we're so focused on all of the uh, transportation alternatives we want to put out into the world, whether they're walking or cycling or public transit. Um, but, you know, I think we're not going to get to a truly equitable answer until we start looking at all the free stuff that we're giving away <laughs> to car users, which is completely not equitable. Um, and I think that's another great benefit, if you want to call it that, of, of the lockdown, where we really physically saw how much space is going to cars and how wasted it is. Um, and, uh, you know, there are cities all over the world that give too much space to cars. And so I think we have to start pricing it. We need to start taking parking away, pricing the parking, pricing the roads. And often people think of congestion pricing and things that are um, costly like that as not equitable tools, but it's, it's not the right way of looking at it. We need to start charging those users taking that money and subsidizing other forms of truly sustainable transportation. So, and I know New York has done a great job in finally getting the congestion charge passed and we're just waiting for approval from the federal government. Hopefully that will come, but I think we need to do a lot more of not just the carrots, but the sticks, if we're going to get to more equitable land use, more equitable um, alternatives. Hey, Chris, could I uh, add on to what Heather just said? I, I think that's a really important point. And again, from our point of view, we're working with a lot of cities on just simple thing of looking at their urban forest, right? And trying to determine um, how we might uh, reutilize spaces that are basically a result of right-of-ways that aren't doing anything for the environment. And so can we take utility corridors and road corridors and, and plant them, you know? And so if you could, you know, take the stick and sort of use some of the money that you might generate for a number of programs, but one of them could be just simply an urban forestry project, right? And we did that for the city of Fontana in a greening program. So I think, it, you know, it's, it's not one thing, it's many things that uh, can solve the problem, but I think it, it comes with sort of uh, incent, not decentivizing sort of cars, right? through taxation or, you know, levies or whatever you want to call it and use that money elsewhere. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, Heather, I'm, I'm gonna pose one to you that was uh, from an audience question, um, which was, um, have you started to, we've been talking a lot about uh, public policy and the, the role of government. But have you started to map out how the private sector uh, can be productively engaged in, in mode shift? Another huge question. <laughs> um, mapping out, uh, yes and no. Um, you know, there's there's so many opportunities. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of opportunities for the private sector to play, and we're already seeing those um, in New York, in cities all over the world. You know, with the advent of bike share. 
micro all forms of micro mobility scooters kick scooters electric scooters um, of course, um, even uh, TNCs, Uber and, and Lyft, all of these folks have become a part of the picture. Um, and I think they, all, all of these uh, companies are also trying to, of course, figure out where they are in the landscape as the landscape continues to shift. But I, I, as we've been talking about having kind of a, a broader um, range of options that really work as our climate changes and we, we need um, more adaptable solutions. I think there will be newer, more micro solutions that crop up from the private sector, but it really still is the job of the public sector to make sure that the policies are in place so that those companies are operating um, well. So I think that comes back to, again, this needing to get the pricing right, pricing of the roads, pricing of space, correct, so that we're getting the solutions that really work for the for the public sector. But I do see a lot more opportunities um, with the private sector. Um, I think one area that we're seeing as really attractive in other places that um, maybe not so much here in the US, but it is growing, is the opportunity for more mini buses. Um, around the world in most cities there are tons of informal mini buses that are the transportation system and in um, many places they have now um, brought those uh, companies those franchise companies small companies and modernized them um, improved their fleets some of those mini buses are now going electric in cities like jakarta um, so I think that, you know, it's about making sure that those smaller companies can be incorporated into the broader landscape of transportation that we're looking for. And again, I think it's it's more about those smaller forms of either, either micro mobility or mini buses um, that have a lot of potential. But I do think that, you know, we can't go away from the idea of having corridors like we do with the metro and bus rapid transit, because if we want those dense neighborhoods that we can walk to in 15 or 20 minutes, we still need that the idea of the dense corridors. So as we let, um, you know, the private sector sort of determine its own course, we still need that kind of land use policy setting for, for the density. I'm seeing some some affirmations in the chat as well, so that's that's great uh, having having folks um, chime in there as well. Um, Marianne, this all sounds very complicated. Um, how how are you think in some of your work? How have you been thinking about governance uh, around resilient transportation systems, um, and how do we how do we adopt those those governance systems uh, to be as effective as they can in advancing our goals? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, some of what um, Heather said resonated, um, you know, in terms of like collaborating with the private sector. Um, you know, I think that um, from what I can tell, you know, I feel like there needs to be a change, a reform in the way that um, you know, we think about transport. Um, and the, the, what I'm going to say is sort of more of a thought experiment, I'd say, because I, I don't think that there are because I, I know that the, the governing of transport is so complicated in so many places that different people make the decisions, people, different people hold the budget, um, and it's not always aligned. And I, from my work, uh, you know, with transport, transport departments across the world, I, I know how complicated that can be. And that's obviously not a problem that, you know, we can solve right now. But, um, you know, it, it's always struck me that um, transportation is a system, um, and then we should take a system's view um, to transportation and mobility. Um, and that system's, um, you know, aim or goal should be to increase um, accessibility so that people that, you know, the main aim of the system should be how easy it is, is it for people to get to their jobs, to get to school, to get the services they need um, in the good times. And also, you know, when there's a disaster, how, how robust is the system and, you know, how, how able is it to withstand, um, uh, you know, the, the, the event um, and support in, in recovery. Um, and, you know, to me, you know, in thinking of a transport authority that's maybe oriented that way, you know, in thinking about the performance um, and, you know, the, the aims of what we're trying to achieve rather than just, uh, you know, the assets and the infrastructure and the network, you know, you, you think it has to be an authority that's um, interdisciplinary. There's a lot of different people who work there. There's climate scientists, there's land use planners, there's, um, you know, there's people who are, yes, are engineering experts and thinking about climate adaptation of infrastructure. Um, but there's also community engagement experts. And I imagine that an authority or, you know, an agency that's much more um, mixed in terms of, you know, the type of people who work there. Um, and, you know, because I, I feel like, you know, a plan that an agency like that would put out is sort of a vision for um, how do we make 
uh, mobility in our city work for all of us? You know, what is that? What are the metrics that we would use then to measure the success of our mobility system? Um, you know, it, you know, maybe it wouldn't be like, here's the number of roads that have been serviced. I don't know, it might be different. Like, this is how fast the average person's commute is. Um, and, you know, maybe we could look at that uh, in a cross sector of, um, you know, income bands um, or, you know, uh, or different sort of socioeconomic metrics. Um, I don't know, I think it's, I think it's interesting. And, you know, in terms of thinking about the type of places who maybe have done a little bit of this or are, you know, heading that way, I do think of Singapore and of, um, of London, like Singapore has that land transport authority where they sort of, um, you know, where there's uh, definitely integrated thinking about land use and transport. Um, and they're definitely, I mean, given Singapore is such a small place that it's hard to uh, compare that with, uh, you know, and necessary and draw maybe necessary lessons for, for New York, but, um, it's, uh, you know, it's the, the ability or, or the forward thinking, you know, um, aspects of Singapore in terms of thinking about how to, um, how to plan for these things in tandem and together, uh, you know, speak to, I think, all the stuff that we've talked about. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks very much. Um, you know, I think Jay's talk started with this uh, thought experiment of looking very, very far far into the future. And I wonder if we can uh, return to, to some of that kind of thinking uh, a little bit and um, in the ways, so we talked a little bit about climate impacts, but you know, another phenomenon that uh, many communities are, are starting to have conversations around is, is climate migration, um, right? That uh, those, those areas where we currently reside on coastal cities and in wildfire hazard areas um, may become less and less habitable over time and we may see a long-term population shift um, to places that are uh, uh, less exposed. Um, what implications does that have uh, for our transportation and land use planning? Uh, what, uh, you know, are we going to see a, a more of an embrace of, of transit-oriented development um, Maybe I'll start with uh, with Jim and, and ask, um, you know, what what are you seeing in the uh, planning and design um, uh, of communities in these areas? Well, so it's a really important question, Chris, and I appreciate it. Um, so, in in some of the things we're doing, we're uh, trying to understand what the implications are for this migration. Uh, current studies, like from National. Uh, Academy of Scientists suggests that the upper sort of Midwest of the United States and, and the lower portion of Canada would be sort of more ideal given uh, climate uh, changes, uh, but also that water availability is a factor, energy, of course, and then uh, suitable soils, right, to produce, uh, to produce food. Uh, so given all of that, uh, you know, some of the areas like in Iowa and Nebraska and the Dakotas, you know, might actually be places where we need to think about densification. Um, and given that a lot of that land area is fairly rural, it may give us an opportunity to actually plan things that uh, can be pretty much idealistic, that aren't necessarily constrained by, you know, existing infrastructure elements in the coastal cities or the southern cities but to really rethink uh, how we plan cities um, to address these issues. So, you know, I think it's uh, an interesting question and one worth continue to talk about as, as we move forward in the future and these, these issues become more evident to us. Great. Heather, same, same question to you, but maybe with a more of an international lens and how you're thinking about um, uh, cities around the globe that are becoming more and more exposed. Um. Yeah, it's a, I, I guess my thought first went to um, all the migration that is happening already into cities that is becoming overwhelmed by, you know, climate events. Um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing a huge influx of people into slums into cities. Um, so this is something that we're really focused on because, you know, one of the things, again, we found in this pedestrians first tool is that, you know, sometimes those informal settlements are actually some of the best for that kind of community. They are small services sometimes are absolutely not available, but often some of those healthcare and educational services are actually um, quite nearby. So it's a question of how can we really upgrade slums? make them safe, make them healthy, um, make them sanitary, 
um, and make sure that those services are there because we, we know that um, this is only gonna become an increasing problem um, and that unfortunately a lot of people just aren't gonna have a chance to migrate to places with better weather. Instead, they're just gonna be left dealing with, with what they've got. So um, yeah, I think this is gonna be a huge issue going forward. And luckily there's been a lot of um, studies on that and ways that we know that it's about you know giving people more ownership over their land so that they can continue to invest. And some of the countries where we've seen the, the most advancement it has been because of improvements in land tenure, which goes back to some of the questions that we were already talking about with um, governance and, and land use. So that's sort of where my mind went to first um, in thinking about um, the, the rest of the world. Right. Jay, you started with this and your, your whole idea was that it's going to be the uh, it's going to be energy constraints that really uh, necess necessitate our mode shift. And we've been hearing about all these these carrots and sticks. And 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 do you think that's do you think that is uh, a, a, a true statement that it's it's not until we have severe energy constraints that we're going to see a massive shift? I think, I mean, I think it's up to us. <laughs> There's two options, like car culture is gonna die, but we can either kind of let it go voluntarily and do it in such a way that avoids mass immiseration. So we do it soon and we do it in such a way that we set up alternative modes of infrastructure. Or it's gonna die in a few decades because we no longer have the energy to build and maintain and drive cars. And that outcome is associated with mass immiseration and really, really bad outcomes for most people on the planet and societies. Um, so I would prefer that we do it sooner rather than later and we do it in a way that doesn't immiserate everyone. Um, but it's, you know, either way, there's not gonna be very many people driving in the year 2150. It's not gonna happen. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> You know, we've, we're, we've got about five minutes left. I would like to uh, shift away from uh, the, the, this mass misery <laughs> and maybe shift to more, more positive notes. So I'd love to just close out and hearing from, from each of the panelists um, a joy that you have, you have heard about uh, around mode shift um, or, or a hope that you have uh, for how we can, we can transform places like, like New York and, and cities around the globe. I can maybe start, <laughs> which is, you know, maybe the kind of flip side of the question is, I do think sometimes things have to get really bad before they get better, right? And, you know, the fires are getting bad, the floods are terrible, uh, you know, the waste management situation in most cities because of these things are just, it's really, really terrible. So. You know, I think we are seeing governments step up, realizing that it's getting too bad to handle. And if nothing else, it's just the costs on the system are increasing so much. Um, and also just, you know, worries about immigration and such. But so the bright line side of that is that, you know, we are seeing cities, Paris, London, um, you know, Kampala, Addis Ababa, Jakarta, many cities around the world, not just Paris and London, really stepping up and investing in these transportation alternatives that we're talking about that are so much more sustainable. Um, and we also see huge governments making big commitments on zero carbon economy-wide targets. Finally, right? Europe and China recently made zero carbon targets economy-wide. Um, you know, I know we've talked a lot about how electrification doesn't get us there, but it is amazing to see China is investing so much in electrification, including charging structures, uh, uh, charging infrastructure everywhere. Um, and, you know, rail that's all around transit oriented development. And so, you know, I think we are seeing shifts. We are seeing this realization happening. We are seeing big commitments. We've been looking at this for a long time, so we have solutions that we're ready to offer. So I hope that this getting bad is really gonna set us on the right course to getting, getting better. Chris, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, as a practicing urban designer, I, I work with cities and 
developers and such. And I think at an even smaller scale uh, in the places that we tend to work, we're, we're seeing evidence in public sector cities really understanding these issues and really acting on them, changing policy, trying to work together. Like where I live in Denver, the city has reshaped its governance and departments are now talking to each other, trying to figure out how they deal with these issues. So I'm encouraged by that. I think we're seeing it, you know, in, in the corporate world, uh, you know, the triple bottom line thinking that corporations, many of which have a huge impact on the world have taken. Uh, we did a project where ExxonMobil was part of it. Um, they are looking to different forms of energy, but at the bottom, at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, uh, creating a more sustainable business, which is really reacting to these, all of these things we're talking to. So I'm optimistic that while not everybody's embraced it and knowledgeable, there are leaders and leadership that's going to be super important in this to make, you know, sort of a, a, a change. The question is how quickly can that change occur and how responsive will we all be able to be right to meet these challenges. Um, okay, so I'll chime in now. Um, so my joy isn't necessarily about mode shift uh, in this time, but uh, something that I've um, experienced, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, living in New York right now during this unprecedented time is also the level of um, local community, um, uh, you know, activism and activity. That um, I live in a neighborhood where. Uh, it popped up on my Instagram feed one day, but uh, there is there are people who are uh, you know who have um, organized themselves to clean um, the parks um, up here and um, you know and the streets because the Department of Sanitation is obviously not able to do it as frequently and the parks is running out of money um, to do it. But uh, you know just that level of um, civic engagement uh, has been really heartening. Um, you know, and I yeah I feel like uh, I'm very excited to see what will happen in New York, uh, you know, in the very near future, because, um, yeah, there's just a lot of excitement, a lot of um, desire to participate um, politically, uh, you know, um, you know, proactively uh, and, you know, work um, to improve the city. And then on a really, really small note, I really wish New York City would um, make all those uh, shared streets permanent because we have one pretty close by. I have two young kids and it's not like we have a ton of outdoor space. I'm, they would love to learn to cycle on that street. So please, New York City DOT <laughs> or whoever it takes, please make those streets permanently shared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I definitely, definitely agree with that. Um, for me, the bright spot is that if only 40% of the current bike boom sticks, then we will still have achieved a generational shift in mode share. And we did it in like 10 weeks. <laughs> I think that's cool. I will add that um, I've been very heartened uh, as a newcomer to Los Angeles, the one of the most famous car oriented cities that voters have voted multiple times to give themselves uh, to, to fund transit, um, to pass sales tax measures, uh, and to make major investments in advance of the 2028 Olympics. Um, and I, I hope that is, that's a sign of, of what's, what's yet to come. Uh, on that note, I would please urge everybody, everybody, please vote if you have not done, done so already. Um, and we're right, we're right at our time. Um, I wanna thank uh, all of our panelists. Thank you so much. This was a, this was a wonderful discussion. Thank you uh, all of our attendees for, for being engaged through the chat and Q&A uh, as well. Um, I, I don't know if Transalt staff want to uh, hop in and, and deliver any last remarks, but, um, but on behalf of everyone here, I, I certainly wanna relay my thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and everyone on the panel and everyone for sending in stuff. It was cool. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank great, you. great fun. Thanks for having me. Take care. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye.